And in the book, you talk about a woman seeing a 10-foot-tall Bigfoot, and I'm thinking, well, there you go. I mean, that's a giant right there. Right. I mean, you know, exactly. the, 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 they grow them bigger up there in Alaska from what I understand, and more aggressive, it seems to be, that that's kind of a theme. I know that the aggression part, when it, the, the Charlie the Prospector in Thomas Bay, that's a story that you covered in the yes. book, too, and, and that one is a, is a horrifying account because – the guy found gold <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I don't care. Uh, you can go look for the gold. Uh, I'm out of here, be, you know, whatever. Good luck. And he's just like, all I want to do is get home. I just want to go. I don't want to be here. You know? And so that was it. He wanted to go back to, I think Seattle or whatever. And he asked his friends to just help him get out of there. He didn't care about the gold he found or nothing. He just wanted to get out of there because whatever he saw was so, uh, was so terrifying and the Bigfoot are so big and, and powerful and uh, I've often thought that they were a direct correlation, uh, some of them especially more than others that are so so large um, that they have to have some sort of Nephilim, you know, roots, you know, something. Here's here's something interesting. Now, I'm, and I'm not like, like I said, I've studied a lot of different religions and I've studied a lot of esoteric, you know, like th there's a lot of different aspects, like the book of Enoch. It's not technically a part of the Bible, but I think it should be. I think in the... the yeah, the Apocryphas, um, very interesting. The Gnostics are very, very interesting. Um, one of the things, oh, yeah. I, the Hadith is not necessarily in the Quran, but it's like a part of it, you know, sort of, I guess. Mm -hmm. Just like the uh, Kabbalah is not really a part of the Torah or the Talmud, but it, the, the Kabbalah is a book of mysticism, a Jewish mysticism. Um, one of the things I read in there, and I don't subscribe to any of that, like just like, you know, like I said, but like, I do believe in the Book of Enoch, but the others, it's, it's just speculation and it's just interesting. Um, just like the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, I've read that too. Uh, a lot of weird stuff in there. But the Kabbalah says that the demons are basically what we know of as demons are fragmented beings that came from a from another universe that was like, for lack of a better term, like it was compressed like it was like smashed or something. Yes. Um, yeah. And that they are compressed beings that were like thrown together like chimeras. Like a, there's that word again, but, and so it's very weird. And so some of them are, have traits of all these different types of, you know, and that may just be an ancient understanding of the, the best they could say, Hey, this is what this is. Um, but I always thought it was very interesting. I know that when King Solomon, um, I did a show about that on alternate realities and King Solomon was one of the subjects and he had the ring, you know, because Ornius, the the vampiric demon, was was yeah. And so, anyways, he took that ring, and of course, there was a demon that was that was named Asmodeus. It was very evil, and he was kind of like the leader, the head demon at that time. And he uh, tricked Solomon into throwing the ring into the ocean when he was drunk. Now, there's different accounts of how it went down, or whatever. But what one thing that I found interesting was that 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 the 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 donkey you know, as, as known as a jackass is known that that's the reason why that term jackass exists because it's a derogatory term for someone who's stubborn and ignorant, right. but, but his continence, I guess that's how you would say it. His, his, the way he looked was of a, of a jackass was of a donkey. He had like the head of a donkey and right. he was supposedly very uh, stubborn and very proud. And he had to be flogged by Solomon to get him to, to be subdued because he was, he wasn't going to go for it. And, so I thought that was that was weird a weird correlation there that, that these entities oftentimes they have animal and variant different types of characteristics they can have tentacles and who knows what else but it it's explained by the Kabbalah that that's what that is you know and now I said like I don't dabble in magic I don't get into that I'm not into any of that kind of stuff but I have read I'm like you have read extensively so many books and like. I just was telling, uh, actually, I was talking to Linda Godfrey the other day, and I told her that I, it's almost like losing some, you know, a family member. I had to sell a bunch of my books because there was no room in the house, and everybody's like, you have too many books, too many bookshelves. So I had to go to Half Price Books, it's, you know, and get basically nothing for my books, but maybe someone else could get some use out of them. But I just have read so many because when I started doing this research as a young man, there was no uh, internet. Like you said, this was pre Google, and you couldn't go and and just go look up, uh, just go. Hell, I'm just going to Google this. I'm going to figure out what this is. Let me go read about the Gnostics. Right. Now you had to go and find the books. You had to track them down, and so I held onto those books. Now, of course, everybody's my my nephews are sitting right here. They're like, okay, Uncle Wolf, there's a thing called the internet, and you can use it. You don't need all these 
books. But hey, I told them, I said, one of these days, everything could crash and we will need these books for posterity. <laughs> yeah, to burn in case you get oh, cold. Oh, God, come on. See, this is a millennial <laughs> mind I'm dealing with. I'm sorry. Here, could you shorten that to 120 characters? You lost me there. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, you millennials, y'all, y'all, y'all think everything's going to be the fit. Let me tell you something. Ken, uh, I'm talking about Ken Gerhard, he put something on Facebook the other day and I laughed so hard. He found a, a book and he said on there, it's from the, the, the dial up Ovian era. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was the, the yellow pages. And some yeah. people don't know like, like, wow, look at that. I haven't seen the yellow pages in years. I mean, that, that's funny that he found that because you know, if you take a dial up phone and you hand it, Tony, you probably don't even know what that is. You probably don't the even know how to use it. Do you know how to, to spend the dial? Yeah. Cause I just told you. You no, have no okay, idea. No, you're Say, not gonna take credit for that. No, I know how to use a dollar phone. Who told? Who taught you? Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the Kool Aid with the other. I friend. thought about yeah. it myself. I'm so exactly. smart. I figured it out. Exactly. I was like, oh, come on. You see what I'm it. dealing with here, David? This is what I deal with on a daily basis. Let's get more about these yellow pages. Let's talk about things that you know. Okay. Uh, well, it, just, well, I don't understand what this is. The yellow. Okay. The yellow pages was a book. Are you being serious? No. Are you trolling me? Obviously, I know what yellow pages is. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Well, yeah. You're you're pretty young. Anyways, anyways, we're getting off track. But you see what I'm saying? Like, like we had to go and 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 use books to learn, you know. And so, having read like a ton of this stuff, you know, I mean, like now you can just go and Google. Anybody wants to to look up what me and David are talking about here, you can just go and Google it, you know. But it's books to me are. I just I can't understand the the replacement of them. Like I have a Kindle. That I keep a bunch of books on, and I have a bunch of Audible books, on, you know, my phone, and I have all these laptop and all this other junk. But I still like the books because David Weatherly, folks, cannot sign your Audible book. Okay, <laughs> he cannot sign his autograph on your book that you're reading on your Kindle. Okay, and it's not going to be worth anything. But if you get a signed copy of his book, it's like, hey. You know, this guy signed my book, and I think that's really cool because yeah. I collect autographs too. I will say books have a certain, you know, it's a bit of more of an investment than just looking something up on your phone and reading it. When you actually find the book and you hold it in your hand, you're reading through it. Like I, I feel like I'm a little bit more invested in that than if I just look something up real quick on my phone and was just scrolling through it because, you know, I, having it physically in your hand, I feel like makes you a bit more connected to it and well, you know, absolutely. you're able to – scribble down your thoughts or you're able to, to do whatever you want and um, you draw on the book no i'm talking about like you're able to whatever you're, you're, I, i'm trolling you i know that's why i stopped because you're <laughs> bullying me again all right no the point the point though is that you, yeah. you, you you're right you feel like a more of a connection to it like yeah. yeah and 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 i would much rather have a hard copy of a book in my hand you know and another thing too what happens if if, if you know the power goes out and you can't plug your, your kindle in or your phone or whatever you still have the books you can read you know, if things get really bad, I mean, you know, you got the book. I know here in Texas, <clears throat> electricity, this is going to shock a lot of my listeners. I'm going to tell you right now, a lot, a lot of places didn't have electricity till the late fifties. I'm not kidding. Uh, that, that's a truth. I mean, like my, my great, great uncles, they lived out there in, in property. They didn't, I mean, I, I went to the old farmhouse one day and I was out there and, and the wiring on that thing just looked to, I mean, it was like, what is this? It was archaic, and that was top of the line when they first built it, and that you know, and it was from the fifties, and it just looked like it would burn the house down, you know. And and of course, the walls and everything are, were were all tore up, you know. I went out there about twenty years ago, and I was wandering around looking at it, and it just looked like the wiring just would just cause an electrical fire, like it just didn't look safe at all. I mean, but the, you know, and of course, that was like that was rare that a rancher would have a house with, with electricity that that electrical work was done, I think in the forties. And so you didn't, that wasn't common. That was not common. There were a lot of people who didn't have electricity until the fifties here in Texas and in the rural Texas. Um, so, you know, I mean, you weren't going to have a lot of the modern amenities that people just had, they had gardens, they grew their own food. They had cows and chickens and whatever. Most of my family on both sides are very country very rural and they they grew up you know like they always had chickens they always have cows and sheep you know and i mean there could come a time and i'm not saying that i'm against it either there could come a time when we have to read books again and all this internet stuff just goes away at least temporarily and then i'm going to be the big winner because i'm going to have books <laughs> <laughs> But uh, speaking of books, David, uh, another thing I was going to ask you about in that book, you had a story 
Very interesting. We are talking about Bigfoot. Uh, a guy named Gene Joyner. That was another story in there. He killed a Bigfoot and cut it into pieces. I mean, that was crazy. That that whole that story, like, I mean, like that 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 right there. I'm not going to get into the whole, but that's another story that's in there. That's crazy, dude. Like Alaska, I think that that there is less than what a million people in Alaska. Yeah, well, you gotta you gotta consider. You know, a lot of people don't realize how big Alaska. Is. It's huge. Yeah, uh, and I always tell people, you know, if you want an interesting perspective you can go online and and look at a map of alaska overlaid over top the lower 48 Mm -hmm. and that that's pretty mind-boggling you know to see how much of the uh of the continental u.s it takes up it's 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 amazing it's a vast vast territory and of course much of it it just isn't populated um lots of you know tundra and and wild areas and lots of national forests and you know even some of the areas uh you know one of my favorite uh, series of of accounts was the uh, sightings around lake iliamna which of course is famous for a water monster um but there are also sightings of a hairy man around the lake and you know it's it's you read some of these stories and there there's an account it's it's in the book of a guy who was around Lake Iliamna and he was driving uh, in his, his pickup and he saw this Sasquatch, you know, come out from one side of the road and run across. And his first inclination, he, he jumped out of his truck and <laughs> pulled out a, a a pistol and took a shot at it. You know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's kind of like the root and tootin' old west to a certain degree. I mean, there's a reason it's the last frontier, you know. Uh, so, you know, this, this this whole different mindset, and this guy, I'm sure, was thinking, I don't know what the hell that is, but I'm shooting it, you know. That's, yeah, that, that's I, I, did. I read about that, and they, there was one where two guys were, were they, they, was a, there was one where they, they thought they saw a bear, and they started shooting at it, and it was like, oh, that's not a bear. That's something else, and it was a right. Sasquatch. Yeah, and I was just going like, wow, and my wife, was she was appalled at that, and I was just – and then the, the part about the Gene Joyner uh, killing the Bigfoot and cutting it into pieces, and she was just like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, honey, it's Alaska. it was like the old West. It's Alaska, I mean, what do you expect? Think about the Texas in, in, the, in the late 1800s. You think that people would – well, I killed some sort of hairy thing. I don't know what to do with it. Let me get rid of it, you know? I mean, they had no use for it. I mean, they're not going to care. I mean, I got a story that I'm going to do on my show at some point. I'm going to put a little teaser out there for you. My great, great uncle, and I got to talk to a couple of my cousins that, that, that remember this story. And we'd go out there and we'd stay on their property. They told me a hair raising story. That, that he told me this when I was a little kid. I was probably in third grade. And now you're dealing with country people. They don't care if they give you nightmares for the rest of your life. Uh, he's telling me that. There were some people, this would have been my great-grandfather's brother, S.D. Now, S.D. told me this story. He talked like this. He had this cigar in his hand. He'd always be, you know, sitting there ashing it, and it would always blow in my face while he's talking to me, and he couldn't see very good, so he, I guess he didn't even realize it. Or care. Or maybe he did. He just didn't care, you know. Just thought it built Yeah, he didn't care. They, they, they'd put me in a dually, and they'd all roll the windows up and smoke cigars, and I'd be the only kid at kickball having left arm pain. But... uh you know, he, he, he was one of those kind of people. And I, he told me a story, really bad story that scared me. And, and now he, he would always mess with me, but I mean, I really believed what he was telling us was true. And I was, I was, he was telling us that there was this hairy, these hairy ape type creatures. He didn't call them Bigfoot or anything like that, but he said that they assaulted somebody's house. Uh, and this happened in between Thorndale and Lexington. And he said that they were neighbors of theirs at one time that lived down the road and that they, that when they were kids, they remember having to help these people move because these ape looking creatures with, with white faces. Now I got, like I said, I got to get some more information about this. I want to talk to my cousin and see if he remembers he was there when, when he was telling us this before I get on and give all the details about it. But anyway, it was a crazy story, you know, and I'm sitting there going like, you know, the people that are appalled at the fact that, you know, these settlers or these, these frontiersmen would kill a Bigfoot and not think twice about it. Well, this story, this happened at the turn of the century. And like I said, they, they ended up having to fight with these things um, and drive them off their property, whatever. But they were aggressive and they were violent. And, you know, a, a native Texan in, in, at the turn of the century ain't going to think twice about shooting anything. 
I mean, they're not going to go, oh, this could be an endangered species. Maybe I shouldn't. All they're going to know is it's taking our chickens. Let's shoot it. And then, of course, that starts a whole uh, thing, you know. And uh, my great, great uncle was one of those people like he, he just, you know, he was very frank about it. And he told me, he goes, there's a reason why we don't go out into these certain areas, you know, and, and, and never said anything, you know, beyond that. He just told me that that crazy story that there were these and we'd hear these weird noises at night that I couldn't identify. And he would say, yeah, that's them apes out there. They're, 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 they live in that holler out there and then and they'll eat you. And I'm just, you know, scared you. Um, as a kid, I was, I was scared to death of it, you know, but like, I never really thought much of it as I got older and I was a teenager. I just thought these are all just silly stories that they try to scare me with until like I told you, you know, David, I told you at one time, um, that we were walking home and I saw that dog man and that kind of changed everything. Cause then I believed in all this stuff. All of a sudden, just like overnight, everything changed, you know? But before that, it was just like it was all stories, you know. And so, at some point, I'm gonna I'm gonna get in there and and, and I'm gonna tell that story. But I want to make sure that I do it up and do it correctly and, and get all the details that I can. What from what I remember, I can remember. But I, I think my cousin, uh, he spent a lot of summers out there too, and I'm sure he probably has a little more information. But it, it, it's scary because like if you were if you put yourself in their shoes in a, in a native Alaskan or a frontiersman or a prospector in Alaska or somebody that was, you know, living in Texas at the turn of the century, same thing. And you're, you have these giant wild hairy men or whatever that, that they, they call them Bushmen. I think in the book, they refer to them. They, they don't know what they are. I mean, they're, they're scary. They're huge. They, they might be aggressive, you know, they're not going to think twice about shooting something like that, you know, cause it is kind of like the wild west and the name fits it. The, the last frontier, because that's kind of what it is. Now I know that in the book, you also talked about the military taking a small Bigfoot. There was another story like that. I think the whole Bigfoot thing is just, you have so many, uh, encounters that in Alaska that I think that there, there is just a, uh, I can't even get into, I'm not even going to try to get into any of these because there's just so much of it. And, uh, another one you were talking about Lake, I'm kind of jumping around here. Lake, what is it called? Lake, uh, I can't pronounce it. Lake Iliamna. Lake Iliamna. Okay. This was interesting folks. David talks about a shark, a sleeper shark. They get up to 20 feet long and they're 8,000 pounds. They can be up to 8,000 pounds. And that as possibly being the culprit of one of these uh, sea creatures. Yeah, there's a lot of, well, if you're talking about Lake Iliana, which is a, a freshwater lake, a huge body of water in Alaska, you know, there's, there's various theories that it's uh, the monster in there is a giant sturgeon or, uh, you know, different things. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you look at the aquatic cryptids because, uh, especially, of course, when we're looking at the ocean, uh, there's so much we just don't know about what lives in the ocean. You know, I, there, there's there's so many creatures that are continually discovered, you know, in the depths of the ocean. And part of the reason is that, you know, until recent decades, we haven't had the technology to go, you know, all the way. And, it, you know, every year it, it improves and we're able to go deeper and deeper or send probes and various things down. But, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing the creatures they discover living in, in the depths of the ocean. And when you look at the, you look at the images of some of these things they're finding, then, you know, it really does. It sounds like, uh, it looks like something from a fantastical story of, of decades ago. And you think, okay, well, you know what what used to live there maybe that is is extinct now or has just gone so far down into the depths that we just don't see it anymore and uh, you know the the same is true to a certain degree of some of these bodies of fresh water that uh, just aren't explored extensively uh, lake iliamna is, is a large body of water it's not completely explored we really don't know everything that's down there so uh, you know, at, at some point, I suspect that they'll discover that the, quote, monster that is in there is probably uh, some kind of a giant sturgeon or some um, something related to a known species that we're aware of. Yeah, David, I have a question, another question for you. In, in, in the book you were talking about, and I keep talking about this book. Folks, this is a really good book. I really enjoyed it. I, I liked it a lot. One of the things I was going to ask you about was these mammoths. Now, I mean, not, not to get into a whole big old dissertation on them or whatever, but I noticed, like, I had read about the taiga region uh, in, in uh, Russia. 
and I guess the taiga would be a biodome. I mean, that's like a bio, whatever it's called. That's that's the type of it's a, it's like that tundra type. I know that people in that region. I had never heard about it in Alaska until I read your book, but I had read about it in that area in Russia that people had seen uh, mammoths in that area. Like, and there was a story I read, and I can't even tell you where I read it, but it was like these people had seen the what what looked like these these really thin like they looked sickly actually like they were on their last leg uh these mammoth the, these woolly mammoths and i know that in the book you discuss people seeing woolly mammoths and even one of them disappearing in like a a black cloud or haze whatever i th- i find that very interesting because like i have had reports i mean not I don't get a ton of them or anything but i've had a few of them where people have claimed to have seen what looks like a saber tooth cat, like a Smilodon. Mm-hmm. Um, one right outside of Las Vegas, um, guy had like thought one of them was trying to attack him, um, had gone down to, you know, to use the bathroom and saw this thing, you know, and it kind of leaped out at him and then it kind of dissipated. Like, I mean, what, what can you tell me about that? Oh, I, I thought, uh, you know, I was very intrigued by this whole thing about these mammoth sightings and, you know, to put it in context, for people, please understand, we're, we're not saying that mammoths are parading through downtown Anchorage or anything like that. <laughs> uh, you, again, you kind of have to read the book to understand, you know, we're, we're giving a very condensed uh, view here. But uh, I did find this very intriguing, this idea of a prehistoric survivor. And uh, I've heard stories through the years of uh, purported sightings in places like Siberia, you know, remote regions of Russia. Uh, but there are also some stories from Alaska, too. Now, the Alaskan tundra is, is pretty vast. And again, you know, a good portion of that doesn't see human activity on, on uh, any kind of regular basis. And uh, what I found was that up until the, the late 1800s, there were reports claiming that there were still mammoths living in remote areas of Alaska. So it was, it was really fascinating to dig into some of the early news reports and also uh, accounts from uh, there are accounts from native tribes who were saying that they actually hunted, you know, they, they tribal memory was that they were hunting these creatures for food. And there was a a gentleman who spent uh, something like 12 years or so in Alaska in the late 1800s, who said that he had found evidence of mammoths still surviving at that point. Now, you go beyond that, and it gets a little bit more uh, hazy, so to speak, because you you don't hear a lot of accounts of sightings of these creatures. Uh, But occasionally they do crop up. You know, someone will will claim they saw something. There's actually an account that someone told me after the book was published, uh, who claimed that their father had been flying over Alaska in a small plane and had seen what he swears uh, were mammoths, uh, a a small trail of mammoths moving across the tundra. Uh, So, I mean, that's just a little snippet that was told to me. But, you know, you hear these things occasionally. And and the the story you're referencing, Josh, was actually passed on to me by Nick Redfern, who interviewed a woman who claimed that she had seen a mammoth while climbing in Alaska. And she said that, uh, she saw it and it just sort of, uh, vanished in, uh, with a smoky light substance or something. So, you know, again, we sort of go down the rabbit hole when we start listening to these accounts, it, it's a bit like people seeing, uh, petrosaurs, you know, flying through the air and, and things like this. Uh, people are identifying creatures that are obviously from another age, uh, that are, purportedly extinct but they're seeing them very clearly and and very tangible uh so we have to wonder you know uh what's happening there is is a brief brief window through time opening up somehow uh or you know are one or the other being somehow transported to some degree you know is it is it the witness or is it the creature that is just here at, at our level of existence momentarily it's really hard to say but it is it is very fascinating it gets into uh, a bit more of a a supernatural cause and effect perhaps from uh, what we're talking about rather than than just a, a basic sasquatch sighting but it is fascinating nonetheless and you know I, i've always been a proponent that 
there's not a singular answer for all of these phenomena. I know a lot of researchers want there to be, and a lot of researchers want to exclude aspects that make them uncomfortable. Uh, you know, people like to people like to specialize, and that's you know more power to them. That's that's great. If you only want to focus on Sasquatch sightings, that's great. Uh, but you know, it becomes a bit problematic if you're going to. Uh, remove all the sightings that don't fit the paradigm you're you're hoping is correct. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it may be a, a completely physical, undiscovered ape, but there may be some strange qualities too that we don't quite understand. And unless we study all the the sightings and the reports, you know, then we're not going to reach a. a a solid answer, I don't believe. So we have to look at this across the board from a, a wider perspective in order to understand what we're dealing with. I mean, we have a similar belief. I mean, that's funny that you say that. I think you said it in a better way I could, but we just believe in having an open mind because uh, there's no such thing as an expert in the paranormal because there's no. not enough uh, evidence and research that can be really you know, 100% saying like this is factual. So by having an open mind, you let yourself... Uh, uh, accept it all and you're able to find patterns and be able to pinpoint things a little bit better. I think when you close yourself off, you lose a lot of knowledge and um, possibilities that you're just, you know, closing yourself off to. In a box. In a box. Well, see, now you just said there's no experts. I made the announcement, I think, two shows ago that I am. In, oh, that's right. We were experts. That's I am right. indeed an expert, yeah. yes. Just, not so, self-proclaimed, too. I didn't know if I told you that, David, but I am indeed an expert in all fields. Yes. So if you need anything <laughs> at all, just come to me and I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep me on the payroll, Dave. Okay, Josh Turner, expert. Let me call my expert, and I'll just show up like the guy on Pawn Stars and tell you, "Hey, this is what this is," and and that's it. And but we'll do that for everything. Yeah, and if you ever need me uh, to, to vouch for him, because as an expert, I vouch that he's an expert. So I mean, we've already, and he's a millennial, so he's even yeah, more of an oh, expert yeah, than me. Millennial <laughs> expert, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so David, I have a question for you. Another question. Um, God, I'm full of questions. Uh, one, one of the things that people really, cause like we we're talking about the, the Alaskan book and I can't say enough about it. It's a really good uh, book. And, um, I wouldn't, I didn't just bring you on the show to talk about your book, but, but like, I know that that was your most recent one. Are you planning on doing a project about Texas? Is that something you can talk about? Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's put it this way. There, there will be several other, um, uh, Books coming out in this state cryptid series, but uh, I'll, I'll keep mum on what's coming out. Cool. Uh, I I tend to be one of those people who works on multiple projects at one time because I have so many interests and uh, it's just the way my my brain functions, I guess. But um, I just completed the the next book in the series, which is Indiana, and that will probably come out. I, I would say around Juneish. Oh, cool. And um. Yeah, I don't. I don't tend to talk about too much about stuff that is in the works, simply because, you know, if I if I say something, then people are going to harass me. Well, when's that book coming out? You know, yeah. <laughs> well, and it could change too. You might decide it, 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 that it could know. be three months. It could be you know a year. Uh, it just depends on on various things that come in and and how, and especially with these books, you know, because I, you know, I've, I, I like to I like to really verify things. I, I like to to clear things up and you know make sure I get as as much accurate information as possible uh, into the document when I, you know, before I, I put it out there. Well, you're very thorough, Dave. I can tell you that. I, like I said, you and Nick and, and Ken and Lyle are, are just, I mean, you guys do a good job. And, and like, you're very uh, talented. I guess I could just say you're, you. you're, you're very talented, Dave. I mean, like, I've always liked your books. In particular, my favorite book was The Black Eyed Kids. And that is like you, I know for a while there, if somebody said David Weatherly, like, oh, the black eyed kids guy. <laughs> so I know that you were probably going like, hey man, you know, there's a lot of other books and stuff that I do. It's not just about these black eyed kids, but you did such a good job on that subject that I think that that's what kind of like, you know, people started, you know, remembering you in that way. And I remember I, I ordered your book uh, years ago. I ordered that book. And I thought, what is this? You know, I really didn't know what it was. I just was like, this is kind of interesting, kind of piqued my interest. Um, and immediately it kind of like was like, oh, I get what this is, you know. And so I was like, yeah, let me get this book. And I ordered it and I really liked it. 
And I told you um, about the one incident where, you know, I was working at a place. I'm not going to get into that. But this guy had what I don't, the only thing I could describe it as is a type of black eyed kid uh, encounter. Um, and I talk about it on my show. Um, and I can't remember exactly what episode that is or whatever, folks. You can go back and look in the archives. But, uh, yeah, I was working at this place and this guy had what I think was a black eyed kid. Like I didn't see it myself and I wasn't, I didn't see it on the camera or whatever, but I worked with this guy for a long time and he wasn't like some BS guy that was just going to make up something like, you know, and, and so when he told me that it was just like when he told me and the other supervisor, what he was, what was happening, I was intrigued. And so you, I guess were kind of like, uh, do you want to talk about that? Just talk about how you got started with the black eyed kids thing and, and what, what that is. Well, you know, it was one of those things that uh, I heard about uh, initially online and <clears throat> the, you know, early days of the internet, so to speak, I guess. And, uh, it, it was kind of in that region of the, uh, it wasn't a creepy pasta at the time, but it was in that region of, oh, this could be, or urban legend, you know, or it could be, it, there might be something more to it. And, uh, the long and short is, is that of course the, the most famous sighting, you know, was Brian Bethel, uh, his encounter, which he posted online in 97. And, uh, that was kind of what started the modern wave of these encounters. And, um, uh, Brian's account was that he was in his car sitting at a strip center, writing a check he went down to pay a bill he was going to drop it in a after hours box and uh, two kids approached his car and brian he wasn't in a, a bad neighborhood or anything like that but he he just felt uneasy initially when these kids approached the vehicle and as a result he only he rolled the window down just a little bit he asked them what they wanted and uh you know they proceeded to ask him for a ride and they had all these excuses they said they wanted to to see a movie but they forgot their money and they needed to go home and get their money and, and brian had the presence of mind to glance over at the movie marquee and realize that you know the last showing was you know i don't know it was half over or something you know so it wasn't really making any sense what these kids were talking about and as he was sitting there he grew more and more nervous finally he he really looks at this kid who's closest to the window, makes eye contact with him and realizes that this boy has solid black eyes. And, you know, the kid is saying things, you know, you have, you have to let us in, you know, just, we're just a couple of kids. And, uh, when he saw the solid black eyes, Brian thought, okay, that's, that's enough. And <laughs> he put the car into gear and, and got out of there. And, uh, as he was pulling away, he glanced at his rear mirror and realized that these kids had vanished. And, you know, this, this encounter, he posted it and I don't know which version of, of the book you have. Incidentally, there's a, a revised version of the book came out in 2017. That was a 10 year anniversary of, uh, uh, excuse me, 20, 20 year anniversary of Bethel sighting. And, uh, he, there's a whole additional chapter in the revised edition that is basically, a a lot of input from Brian uh, talking about the encounter still affecting him, you know, 20 years later, this is, he's still disturbed by it and uh, the things it did to him. Because back when I wrote the original version of the book, uh, I tried, I reached out to Brian on numerous occasions and I couldn't get a hold of him. And it was during a period that he had just completely pulled away from, from dealing with any of it because he was so inundated. And he had so many people asking him constantly to tell the story and asking him questions and, and so forth that he just couldn't handle it anymore. And um, he decided to just leave it alone. Uh, but uh, after the book came out, Brian actually contacted me and he, he said that, you know, the, your book is great. It actually helped me reading it because it gave me some different perspectives. And um, so the revised edition, like I said, includes a whole uh, additional chapter. You know, Brian Bethel 20 years later. Uh, but to get back to the, your original question, uh, you know, I had, I had heard about the encounters and thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. It's, it's weird and, and kind of unsettling at the same time, but really didn't start giving it a whole lot of attention until I started meeting people and having people tell me that they had encountered these things. And that's when it got very 
curious and and i ended up of course delving into the phenomenon and writing a book about it and incidentally you know one of the interesting things about the phenomena is that uh bethel was the one who came up uh with this acronym you know bk or black eye kids and brian himself told me that he kind of regrets coming up with the with the term to identify these things because he believes that it, it limited the phenomena to a certain degree. And it, it's interesting that he said that because really, you know, there are sightings of black eyed adults. There's, you know, there's, there's young kids, there's teenagers, all these different things. So uh, I understood what he was saying. And at the same time, it's, it's really stuck in people's heads, you know, this idea of these, these black eyed kids. But uh, when you, when you really dig in, you realize that there's more to it. The, the Bethel's encounter. Yeah. There's a lot more to it. And, and, you know, when I was writing the book, um, at one point, you know, I just, I, I was really looking at this phenomenon, looking at the different aspects of it. And my real breakthrough with that came when I removed that acronym and I removed that phrase and I started looking at the traits that came up, the, the the different aspects of these encounters, and started digging into historical accounts. When you lose that acronym, and you dig into historic accounts, you find that, yeah, there's been these black-eyed whatever they are around for a very long time, and you know, older encounters, of course, didn't call them BEKs or black-eyed children or anything like that. Uh, they identified it often in the context of the, the cultural beliefs or the time period uh, that the encounter was, was had. So, you know, rural parts of this country, for instance, you know, if they had encountered one of these things in, you know, pre nineties, you know, the, the 1980s, 1950s, whatever, then they probably would have thought, Oh, this is something of the devil, you know, it's demonic. Uh, so, you know, other areas would have called them something else. So really, there are a lot of these stories and, and encounters that uh, predate Bethel's account. And it, it's kind of aggravating, you know, uh, so many people do ask me about it. A friend of mine told me, you know, that that book is kind of like your free bird. Uh, they're, they're always going to insist <laughs> that you, you know, you do it. And I just kind of, thanks, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not. Somebody's but, in the uh, audience. Play free bird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, you want to scream. I've done 30 albums since then. But, yeah, you and know. you're like, okay, yeah, let's play Stairway to Heaven again. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, yeah. but, well, you know, the, the thing is, is that it's it, it's a fascinating phenomenon, but it, it's, um, you know, it, it only, uh, it, it goes to a certain degree. And you have to say, okay, well, this is, you know, this is what it is. There are a lot of these encounters, uh, but you have all these people who, uh, again, they, they look it up briefly on the internet and they come to a conclusion, you know, either they think that, you know, black eyed kids are lurking around every corner in town or they think, Oh, it's a hoax. Uh, yeah. You know, somebody is somebody with contacts on. Well, you know, but they do a lot uh, more I, than just walk around uh, wearing oh, contacts. Yeah. I see those, I see those comments and like, you know, you have no idea. You, you say, Oh, okay. You've decided, you've decided because, you know, it's, you can buy black contacts or because, you know, Somebody says something on Creepypasta, you've decided that's the explanation. And, uh, you know, whether it's, it's Black Eyed Kids or Sasquatch or whatever it is, I, I just kind of cringe when those people, uh, you know, put out their expert opinions without doing any research or, or anything else. Well, it's kind of like the person that was pontificating to everyone uh, about when you and Ken were promoting the book and uh, about the Alaskan uh, tr uh, book and – telling everybody this is what it is and this is how you're supposed to say it and you didn't really bother to correct her and i was yeah. like i had private message ken and i was like who is this like yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say something and ken's like no oh, no he goes that's not really david's style he just just let her rant whatever and he just we just kind of laughed it off but you know i mean it is what it is people are going to think that they're experts on everything when they haven't even picked up a book and looked at it right so they don't even know yeah. i mean it's yeah. like you ever see that movie uh what's that movie with the um Jonah Hill's in it, and it, it's super bad. Oh, yeah. And he, he goes, why did you pick Muhammad? He goes, it's the most common name in the entire world. Read a book. You know, <laughs> it was kind of a silly thing for, for McLovin. Like, he chose, the, you know, whatever. But it was just funny because he's right. That is the most commonly used name. And, you know, he's like, read a book. You know, and it's like a, a funny cliche, but it's the truth. I used to say that all the time. 
I was kind of a, a, a jock in high school, but I also played Dungeons and Dragons uh, in the library with a lot of my friends that weren't jocks. And so I was kind of a nerd jock, I guess. Um, <laughs> played ball, but I also read all the time. I was a bookworm and people were like, wow. And, you know, and the guys I played ball with were like, you're always reading. And I'm like, well, because I want to know stuff, you know. Right. You're not going to learn stuff if you just, all you think about is playing ball. I mean, you got to have, there's more to the brain, less to the boot. And, you know, and I know that, uh, that's one thing that's very important. I mean, it, it's like to, to, to read and you on the black eyed kids thing, man, that's, it's cool that you, uh, that you, that you, uh, touched on that because I have thought about that before that these things are, they're, they're not just children. Um, it is insidious that they come in the guise of children in the way that it seems like it lets people get, let their guard down. You know what I mean? But in the story that, that I told that happened to a guy, he's from Eastern Europe and, and it, it wasn't, it was more disturbing to him than that they were kids because they just appeared out in the middle of nowhere. Now, if they would have just been a, a, like, he, like he said, an adult that had walked up, uh, even though they were looking weird like that, he could understand them saying, Hey, can I use a phone? But three children to show up at three in the morning at his guard shed, at the, at that checkpoint and just be asking to use the phone and come in. It was, it was more disturbing for him and more creepy and it made him more, uh, on edge than it would have been like an adult. Now he said, you know, if it would have been an adult, you could have thought it's a prowler or it's a homeless person and you'd, you'd just be like, okay, you can't use the phone. You got to go, whatever. And, but it was because they were kids at three in the morning. It was so bizarre. It was so bizarre. Yeah. yeah. And so that when he told us that, you know, story, or when he's retold that story, because we were working together at a job, at another job, and he retold that story to, to someone, and they were just like, wow, they were children. Now, I didn't go around calling them black-eyed kids, because the term, I don't think, had been coined at that point, because I didn't know what the heck they were. And uh, I hadn't really heard of the black-eyed kid phenomenon, just like I hadn't, I wasn't going around calling what I saw a dog man. Or some of the, the stories that I've gotten over the years, uh, I call them gargoyles, but I don't really know what they are. I just put them under a file that's like flying creature, flying humanoid. Um, but then you're sitting there going like, okay, this person saw one in Ohio. This person saw one in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Two totally different places, but it's the same creature, or at least has the same similar si similar yeah, 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 similarities. similarities. And one of the things I know, Tony, you, this is my godson here, he... We, we, we go through the emails sometimes and we'll, we'll both see an account at the same time, be like, whoa. And then we'll start saying, Hey, let's look at, but then you already saw it. And I'm going like, that's crazy because we already know we have a thread for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it lines up with something else that we've, uh, and that just happened to me recently. Actually, uh, somebody sent me one about it happened to me recently too. Yeah. It's yeah, funny because I just I, I saw an account that reminded me of Anthony. What happened to Anthony? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that, that's funny that happened. And it lines up. You know, so, but the black eyed kid thing, like I said, I only got about a couple of those and I'm sitting on one waiting for my buddy to come on and talk about it. Cause he can tell the story, but, um, it is weird and it is bizarre. And, uh, one, one of the accounts I got, and it's, it's not real, it's not, I don't really, I can tell it here. It's not really that big a deal, but this friend of ours has a trail cam. His name's Luke. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, he put up a trail cam and this guy like i mean in the middle of nowhere i'm talking about like way out in the hill country in the middle of nowhere this guy just walks up i mean he, a good probably eight miles from anything and he walks up to the trail cam and he's looking at it and he's fully uh nude he's he doesn't have any clothes on and now my buddy didn't think nothing of it you know but he said that you know what's weird is that when when they started kind of examining the the footage or whatever they noticed that his eyes were completely black and when he said that, you know, he told me that and I said, well, that don't count, Luke. He's not a kid. No, nah, I just, I didn't tell him that. But seriously, I just thought that that was weird, you know? And so, and my buddy Loki, uh, that's his nickname. He, he has uh, one of a, of a guy fully nude, just walking by in front of a trail cam, which is just weird out in the middle of nowhere there again. You know, when, uh, Sal used to be my co-host, we were talking about that when he told us that. And we were just like, dude, that is so bizarre. Like this dude is just walking around out in the middle of the woods you know, so when, when Luke had actually sent me that, that clip or whatever, it was like a, it's just like a real brief clip. You, you can't really, like he kind of analyzed it, you know, and everything. And it's not a real, it's not real good footage, but you can see that the eyes are kind of black and it's just, it's just weird. It's just like a real bizarre thing. Like, I mean, 
I guess you could say that maybe he was on some sort of drugs or something, and maybe so he was wearing your eyes black. Yeah, it makes your. Well, no, I was going to say maybe he was wearing contacts. People oh. will break it down however they want. They'll say that it's nothing. It's just some crazy guy out there. But the fact that the nearest anything is eight miles away, this guy wandered out in the middle of a pasture in the middle of nowhere, and and, and you know, and he's he's just his eyes are completely blacked out. <clears throat> now. I've wondered, you know, before, like what these guys, what these things are, like I have my own theories, like some people believe that they are hybrid, hybridized alien and they're doing, you know, the fact that they have, people have gotten sick when they've d encountered these things, the fact that people have had like, um, like nightmares and all kinds of weird stuff associated with them, bad things happen to them makes me lean toward them being some sort of demonic or maybe possessed. I, I don't know. But I mean, like I, like I said, there's a lot of theories out there. Well, even just the, you know, aura right. of un uneasiness when they meet them. Like, you know, uh, I remember you telling me a story about how like when he saw or when, whoever saw it, uh, the black guy kid, like even though it was a kid, he felt very uncomfortable and like unsafe, like uh, not really in danger, just like, more like you know unsettled unsettled exactly because it was three in the morning and it was a little kid yeah. i mean that that's <laughs> that would be unsettling uh like like my friend he had an encounter with one and i mean like he or a couple of them a couple of kids or whatever and they were talking about they were hungry they wanted food and uh like i said i'll try to get him on one day and talk about it and if not then i'll just tell the story one day but the the fact that they they show up in the middle of the night asking for things you know and being children is a little more disturbing to me than being adults because what are nine ten eleven year old kids doing wandering around asking to go in inside and use the phone at two in the morning I mm -hmm. mean it's just bizarre it's weird and like I guess my question to you David is what in, in your opinion if you had to give an opinion on it I mean what is your opinion on this what do you think they are what could they be well, the you know just to be clear, the book covers all the various theories uh, as to what these things might be in this. You know, the popular uh, schools of thought is is that they're either something demonic uh, or that they're some kind of alien human hybrids. Uh, I lean more towards them being some type of interdimensional creatures. Uh, back to that whole quantum physics idea of other levels of existence. Uh, you know, I, I think that these things, I, I don't believe they're children for one moment. No. I think they're taking the form of children because it is a way to um, catch people unawares. And, Disarm over their guard. Yeah. Uh, Disarm you. know, yeah. it, it is, um, it, it appears to me that they are coming with a singular intent, and that is to create fear. Uh, because in most of these encounters, uh, when you read them, all, almost all the encounters, uh, when you read these stories or, or hear these accounts, uh, people encounter these kids. Uh, the witness or the victim goes through a, a series of things from uneasiness to that ramps right up to, to fear and, and the flight response. Uh, and once that peak of fear is reached, these kids vanish. So, you know, that, that sounds like something that is coming to feed off of fear. Uh, you know, fear is a powerful emotion and uh, a powerful energy that's generated. So I, I think that it's very possible we're looking at something like that that comes in to create this dynamic. And once it does, mission accomplished. You know, it, it, it leaves. It's either that or these things are coming and they're really testing people and seeing how far you know how much they can get away with and how far they can push someone or or, or what they need to do to create levels of comfort uh you know or or uh catch people with their guard down uh but again there's this very definite reason whatever it is that they're taking the form of children and you know we have to be honest here too and realize that anytime you mix children with anything that is, is supernatural or paranormal, it, it it creates a different dynamic. And you know whether it's the ghost of a child or uh, you know the one of these black eyed kids or whatever it is, it, it it causes a psychological dynamic in the witness that is difficult for many people to deal with. You know, as adults, for instance, we're 
we're pre-programmed to help kids. You know, if a kid approaches you in the street and says, Mr. I'm lost or, or Mr. I need water, you know, whatever it is, your automatic reaction is going to be to try to help this kid. Um, most, most adults, you know, so when, when that experience occurs, but at the same time, all your personal warning signs are going off, it's, it, it creates a dynamic. It creates a psychological battle uh, within these people that is, is um, very confusing and very difficult to deal with. So you see these uh, this hesitation, you know, because, oh, here's a kid that needs to come in and use the phone. I should let him in. But why am I nauseous or why is all the hair on the back of my neck up? You know, what's wrong here? Yeah. Uh, what's, because in most of the encounters, you know, the people don't realize initially that the kid has solid black eyes. It's usually somewhere in the midst of the encounter uh, that that's revealed. You know, often it's because the kid's looking down at his shoes or, you know, looking away or, or you know, the person's not focusing just on their eyes or something. But at some point in the encounter, they realize this kid has solid black eyes and it, it pushes the, the victim over the edge and they the flight response kicks in. So... I'm going to tell you right now, after reading that book, if any kid knocks on my door for any reason, I'm not answering the door. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. I'm sorry. I mean, I just, <laughs> it's, like, it's, I'm just kidding, but it is very unsettling. It is very unsettling. And I mean, like I, uh, didn't, I like I had, I've, I've heard stories of like people who've had hauntings and things and they involve children and it is unsettling. It is weird. I lived in a house that had a bunch of weird activity um, I've talked about it before and it's, it's, there was, uh, like one of the, I, I would say one, because it was not, there was more than one. It was one of the entities that was being encountered was that of what appeared to be a child. Like I never saw it full on, but I did see the shadow, what looked like the shadow of a child. And that was really, that was really, uh, not only was it like scary, but I, I, I think it was more like sad. It made me feel sad. Like, I don't know, like there was some sort of like, um. I don't know. It, it made me just very, um, I don't know what the word would be, forlorn maybe. I don't know if that's the correct word. I felt very, um, I don't want to use big words. It's not like crestfallen. <laughs> I don't know what the, but it was just, it was unsettling to say the least. And I, and I think that if you got a knock on the door and some kids were asking for water or food or whatever, and then you notice their eyes looking all weird I think it would it would put off a serious level of fear, but I think at first though it's disarming. So I do agree with the the whole fear aspect of it, but I also think that maybe there's some other purpose that they're trying to wh why they want permission to come in. Like why are they trying to get into your house, you know? And if they're coming in the guise of children, they're trying to make you let your guard down so that they oh, can sure. fulfill some sort of nefarious purpose. Yeah. Um, because, you know, and like, I know Nick, uh, you were talking about Nick Redfern, he wrote about, you know, black, uh, the men in black. Well, right. I mean, they'll just show up and they just look like adults and they'll just show up and they'll scare the crap out of you and make threats and whatever, knock on your door and tell you do this, do that. And it's unsettling to say the least, but I mean, it's not, it's a totally different phenomena. So, I mean, if it was just to cause fear, I mean, I guess it seems like, it would create another dynamic, but it wouldn't be totally just the fear factor. I mean, if, if it was something that you could shape shift into to, to look like, I think that the dog man is a perfect example of that. Uh, I know Vic kind of is, he's a good friend of mine and I've been on the show and, and he always says that, 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 that their primary goal is to create fear inside of someone and panic. And that he thinks, he thinks that they feed on the fear. <clears throat> There's some sort of, uh, like they get something out of it. And I know that, uh, that Linda has, Linda Godfrey has said that, uh, uh, that these things that, they, they, that people feel like they're, they're angry at them for seeing them, you know, but it's like there again, it creates like this heightened level of fear, an emotion that these things seem to thrive on or feed on. So to me, not to, uh, disagree, you know, with you completely, I, I agree with part of what you said, but I also think that there would be better means of cre of generating fear. You know what I mean? Like there would be like coming in the guise of a child trying to get a drink of water is not going to be as terrifying. It'd be unsettling. I'll tell you that, but not as terrifying as seeing like a big hairy ape creature or wolf creature or goat 
type creature on two legs, those would be a lot more, uh, it would generate more fear. I know in me, because I mean, being honest, like, okay, at, at the, at the worst, this is a child. You could probably punt it across the room. Yeah. <laughs> you, I was just thinking you like, could probably well, kick it if you had to, you know, it's a very, it's a very different dynamic, however, because, you know, obviously, and I talk about this in the book, I, obviously there is some greater agenda at play, uh, when you look at these things across the board, uh, but it, it's you almost get this sense of of hearing witness after witness. You almost get this sense that uh, there is sort of a, a programmed approach that unfolds, and this this fear factor is clearly uh, sort of the the turning point, the high point of what they're trying to accomplish. Now. Um, you know, you could say, okay, well, I, I would be, you know, terrified, much more terrified of a, a dog man or, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, the difference is, is that that is a different kind of fear. Uh, that is something you can identify and you're initially uh, seeing this thing. Once you uh, wrap your head around, oh, my gosh, this is, a you know, an eight foot bipedal wolf creature yeah you're going to be terrified most likely but uh it's a very different kind of experience than uh someone sort of luring luring you in and saying uh, I, I need help i'm lost uh you know i i want to use the telephone and then uh suddenly the hammer kind of coming down and, and realizing that no this is this is really creepy and you know this is this is just based off of interviewing so many witnesses who have experienced this thing. And, and some of these people, you know, I've talked to military personnel, I, I've, you know, combat veterans and, and, uh, you know, people that have seen really horrifying things and they will tell you that there's something very different about the experience of seeing these things. You know, there's, there's something that is very disturbing because of the level that it gets in on. Uh, psychologically, mentally, and and even energetically, uh, because you know it's just suddenly there's there's just this feeling that you're about to fall prey to something. Uh, so you know, fall, fall victim to something that is is predatory, and you know that's it's a very different kind of, of fear rather than maybe what would be a, a sheer panic from seeing a dog man or something like that. Yeah, it might be like the so, psychological. Uh, I, burden of like seeing yeah, a defensive yeah, what well, like you would describe as like the defensive a defenseless right. like you're, you wouldn't be scared of a kid uh, and then feeling that fear maybe it messes with your psychology a little bit differently and they feed on that <clears throat> than seeing exactly. like something so big and scary and you know it's big and scary so you being afraid of it it might not uh it might like generate something different comparatively yeah and then and then at the same time you know you mentioned Josh, the men in black, which uh, there's a whole chapter in, in the book that talks about the similarities between the BKs and the men in black, which is that in itself is kind of weird. But uh, just like the men in black, you know, you get the sense that there is some other agenda, something else that's going on. And you don't quite know what it is, uh, but it's I, I don't know. Sometimes you, you listen, you know, for me, I've listened to a lot of these accounts and I get this sense that uh, some kind of program is running, for lack of a better word. You know, it's like what you know, it's almost like some weird government program, you know. Oh, we're gonna you know, we're gonna test these black eyed kids and I'm not saying that's what it is at all, but it just is an example, you know, it's it's like there's this secret program that's running and they're saying, Okay, we're gonna test this time we're going to test with kids. Uh we'll give them black eyes, you know, yeah. we'll see what happens uh as they encounter people. Uh, and and this is you know, here's the program, here's what they need to do in each encounter. You know, they, they meet the person, they don't reveal their eyes at first. They try to get in, you know, they try to get something out of the victim and, uh, let's see what happens. Here, here's a weird thing. <clears throat> I had someone who is a listener of my show. And when I, when I did the, the show and I put, when I put that black eyed kid story on there, there was another, uh, a listener that that sent me a story and then this, this she t she prefaced it with like this didn't happen and you know like it, it was it was a dream but she claimed that she had a dream and that kind of stuck with me because here's what's weird it actually gave me a nightmare and I don't, I don't like have nightmares much anymore i used to have them a lot but not anymore but uh this woman she she had a nightmare 
and it was based off of what we were talking about. And she had a dream that this child, this was the dream that she sent me. And I've just thought one day, maybe if I ever did another show about it, or if I ever got the famous David Weatherly on our show, we could talk about it. But she, somebody rang the doorbell of her house. She opened the door and there was a child there. She said it was like a little, a little girl in a white dress, like a little white nightgown. She had like black hair and her hair was just cut like, like straight across the top of her head. Like it looked like, like, you know, like a very, like old time, like the way they would cut the children's hair in the old days. And that she was holding a single flower and then she tried to give her the flower and she said, can I come inside? But she didn't move her mouth. And now she let the little girl in her house and the little girl was like, can you pick me up? I'm scared. My, I'm, I'm, I need my mom. So she picked her up. She was carrying her into the kitchen and the kid, the, the little girl was reaching for the refrigerator. Well, this is where it gets really terrifying. And she was like, up to that point, everything was fine. She started to look at the little girl's eyes and she, she said that the little girl's eyes were completely black. And as she went toward the refrigerator, the refrigerator door opened up on its own and the refrigerator was full of spider webs inside the refrigerator. And there were like human parts in the refrigerator and that the little girl, when she looked at the little girl, her mouth had opened up and was becoming like uh, fangs, like, like, like spider fangs. And that these legs were popping out the back of the little kid and they began to crawl. She began to crawl around on her and wrap around her. And she said she woke up and it just, it, it terrified her. Well, I read that account on my email and I, and I was like, wow, that's weird. And I didn't really think much of it, you know, and I thought, well, that thanks for sharing with that, that terrifying dream you had, <laughs> you know? So late, a couple nights later, I'm, I go to sleep and I wake up and I'm thrashing around and my wife's like, honey, are you okay? And she like wakes me up and I'm like, I almost fell out of bed. And I said, no, I had a dream about a spider, but I couldn't really, re you know how you have those dreams, David, you don't always remember them. And right. then, then later on you're driving and you're like, whoa. And then you almost run off the road. And no, I'm just kidding. But I was driving and I, I, it just hit me like, oh man. And the, so the dream came back to me and it was very similar, but I'm, of course it was planted in my mind by the person's account of their dream. And this all stemmed from her listening to my show. So I guess it just kind of came back full circle, but I ended up like pulling over and like kind of getting my bearings. And I was like, whoa, cause I was, I was on my way to work. And I was going to get there early, so I figured I'd just stop and kind of like, you know, uh, process what the heck it was I was thinking, you know. And in my mind, this the dream that I had was this very similar. There was like these little kids that were playing on my back patio, and when I went out to look out the window, they were they were very tiny though. They were like maybe like two foot tall. I mean, not like Smurfs, but they were little, you know. And they they started to like turn into like spiders, and I was and I have arachnophobia, so maybe that's why her her dream Story horrifying nightmare <laughs> gave me a nightmare. And so and then they started crawling, trying to get inside the house, and the window to one of the bedrooms was open, so I had to run and try to get to get to the bedroom window. And, and before I could get there, they were crawling in through the window, and then they were turning back into people and dropping from the ceiling and the wall. And I was just like, ah, oh, and I. Woke up, but all I could remember was like spiders. And so I told my wife I was having a dream about spiders, <laughs> but it was, it was that, you know, and it was just, it was like, it was very like, uh, real, like it was very vivid, like, but it, but it just kind of like my mind, I got up, started my day and just kind of blocked it out. And then later on I'm driving and, and it just, it hit me, you know, and, but it was from a listener that had given me her terrifying story. Now, the interesting thing about it from the listener, she, she had told me, um, but she never had nightmares. Like she goes, I never have nightmares. I always have pleasant dreams, you know, and whatever, you know. And, and so she said that, uh, after that, you know, she was very, uh, adamant that she was like, you know, for a couple of days she had insomnia, you know, and so it gave her, so this whole black eyed kid phenomenon, or black eyed adult kid, people, whatever you want to call them, ma'am, sir, baby child, whatever they, it, it has a profound effect on people and, and more than just, uh, the whole, you know, just telling a scary story, whatever. And I noticed that with the whole dog man phenomena too, that I've been around for a long time, interviewing lots and lots of people that have had the dog man encounters that, that the nightmares is a big part of it. I had nightmares yeah. about it for years. I talked about it on Vic's show that I, um, would just have nightmares all the time, you know, and just, I couldn't, I was like, I would be on a porch. And I would turn around and the door was like a million miles away. I couldn't get to the front door and I kept running and this thing kept getting close to me. 
Um, and it was a werewolf type creature, <clears throat> but I noticed that the black eyed kid phenomena seems to be a nightmare inducing like phenomena too, much like the dog man phenomena. And of course there are those that'll just say, well, it's all demons. Everything's a demon. You know, it's everything is a demon. I don't agree with that, but that's what some people will say. And then there are those that are going to say, well, it's all aliens pretending to be something, you know, and I don't totally agree with that either, but um, I like what you said though, about it possibly being interdimensional because something that comes from another reality that bleeds into ours or whatever, I mean, that is a very plausible, um, and they feed off of different emotions. Like Tony, you just touched on that. They could feed on an, on a, on a different type of emotion, not just a pure fear emotion, because the dynamic of what this produces is completely different psychologically because it runs it's a different kind. Of, it's a different kind of fear in a sense, you know, it's, it's, you know, a, a dog man encounter, you know, it's kind of like the, the terror that they try to portray in, in werewolf movies, you know, where someone's getting ripped apart, whereas these black eyed kid encounters, they're more, uh, I don't know, they're more Hitchcockian, you, you know, it's this subtle psychological thing that unfolds uh, and the encounters, you know, they don't last that long, but still, uh, for the people who, who are having them, it feels like a long time. And the psychological stages they go through, uh, you know, it really, really disturbs them. And, and, and I've had so many people tell me how terrified they were from the experience and how traumatized they still are. I think the, you know, the Brian Bethel thing kind of says it all, you know, 20 years later and uh, over 20 years now, and this guy is still traumatized by this experience. And, you know, we can, we can look at it from an objective viewpoint and, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, it's nothing with, but kids with black eyes. So what? Well, that's, you know, yeah, that's the physical aspect, but that is not a description of the psychological terror that these people are going through and, and the emotions and everything else that is occurring during the encounter. If you haven't had that encounter, you really can't understand it. You can't. Uh, you know, you can't be in their shoes to comprehend what they're talking about and why they're still so traumatized from the experience. Yeah. And I guess the whole, like we're talking about the men in black, the, I, I've had people, I have friends that are knuckleheads and, and we were talking about the men in black one day. And one of my friends was like, Oh, some guys in black came and started telling me do this, do that. Cause I have a buddy who claims he saw a UFO. And he was like, if men in black come, you know, you know, I'll, I'll beat them down. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I was like, it's not that simple. It's like th these people have this, um, there's like an oppressive air that comes with them, like where they're, you can't think straight That's at right. time. And yeah. And they disrupt some sort of frequency in your brain and to where you don't, you're incapacitated. A lot of times you don't have a normal brain function. You know, you don't have the, the will or the ability. I've heard all these different stories, you know, where you don't have the will or the ability to, you know. And it's like they uh, can tap into your mind, you know, and, and they know that you've had an encounter and they're telling you, you know, to me that smacks big time of some sort of like that, the, the men in black thing I think is an alien. I, I really think it's some sort of, what do you want to call it? An ultra terrestrial, extraterrestrial, whatever, um, interdimensional, whatever. They, they know that you have seen something. And that's why they visited you. And it's not as easy as just being a big tough guy and answering the door and punching him in the nose. I mean, if it was, then you open the door, you beat him up and they go on, you know, but that's not what happens. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's not what happens. I mean, it, it's these people are like, well, I didn't know what to do. And, and they were very forceful and, you know, and I was, I was terrified. And so people just kind of like at a loss for words, they're at a loss for anything, but just to kind of cooperate. And, uh, I think the thing with the black eyed kids is very similar. Um, and it is a terrifying phenomenon. It's something I don't ever want to have to uh, to deal with or whatever. But uh, I had another question, uh, Dave. You now not only you've written a lot of books, and I wanted to touch on something. One of the books you wrote about was was a man has a couple of different books and different stories. Um, the haunted toys, kind of jumping here, but the haunted toys one. Um, like I did a story not too long ago about some objects i wouldn't even call them haunted i would call them cursed um there was like a statue and a key that i talked about on my show that has kind of uh followed me around now we have this key and it it it, it, it for lack of a better it disappears like it doesn't vanish in front of our eyes but it'll move around if that makes sense 
And so, but because I got you here, I wanted to ask you a question about that. Um, what is your thoughts on that? Because on the haunted toys, like, and I know you did dolls and all that. Like, what is the dynamics of that? Like, okay, when someone has like a cursed doll, say like the Annabelle doll, okay, what is the, like, is it demonic to you or is it a child that is disembodied that is protective of their toy? Because we're talking about the black eyed kids. I'm kind of like, you know, I'm curious as to that aspect of it because I'm not a hundred percent sure what I think about that. I mean, I kind of go back and forth. Like I think, well, it's probably demonic or it's something that was obsessed on that object. But like, uh, of course, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of Robert the doll. Oh yes. Yeah. So what is your thought on that? Well, that, that's, that's a whole show in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there's not really a short answer to this. Uh, I, I put a book out late last year called Eerie Companions, a history of haunted dolls. And it really delves into, uh, the whole spectrum of, of how and, and why dolls can be haunted and the different, uh, perspectives of, you know, whether they're cursed or haunted or possessed and, and whatnot, because, uh, again, there's not a singular answer to explain the phenomenon. Of course, Robert is covered in depth in that book. And uh, it also delves into the, the ritual and magical use of dolls because they, they were not originally toys. Uh, so, you know, really without, uh, without expand, expounding on it, you know, for a long time, uh, there's several ways that, a doll can be haunted, uh, you know, be it, uh, something that is, uh, possessing it, uh, taking it over as a, a residence or whether it's from the residual energy of a child who loved the item so much, you know, whether it's a doll or something else. Uh, so, you know, really we're looking kind of in the spectrum of, of energies when we talk about that and, you know, uh, not all the hauntings are negative. Of course, those are the ones that get the most attention. Uh, and of course, sometimes items can be cursed. That goes back to the the magical perspective and the idea that um, of sympathetic magic that a doll can be used to cause harm to a person uh, whose image it is made in. Uh, so the whole haunted doll thing is, is pretty fascinating. And again, it's you know it's such a rich history to. Uh, it, it's one of those things. You know, everybody you say haunted doll, everybody thinks Annabelle. Uh, you know, but there's, there's so, so much more to it. And when you, you know, if you, if you see the book, you'll see that I really delved into the, the magic and the ritual and everything else and how, you know, we've come to this point where, uh, yeah, we, we do have these famous haunted dolls, but there are a lot of other ones that people don't know about too. So it's, it's a pretty interesting, interesting topic. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to come back on at some point and discuss it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Like maybe, maybe, you know, after your new book drops and, and, uh, you want to come on and, and promote that and we can talk about that. I'll, I'll, uh, read your book the new, when the new one comes out and then I'll bring you back and you can talk about the haunted dolls. Sure. Um, yeah, th that would be that. awesome. Well, David, um, I was just wondering, you know, 35 years of paranormal normal research, how has there, are there any other creatures besides, you know, the otter demon boy, uh, whatever it is up in Alaska? No, don't, don't say that. Whatever it is, it's a Kushtaka. I don't know how to say that. So why would I? <laughs> okay. Why would I? Right. Why would I butcher well, that and have some lady yell at me so on Facebook? Well, see, David just corrected you. Forty years. Forty. Oh, my bad. No, 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 I, I, Forty years. I started in the seventies. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, well, uh, well, on Google it says thirty-five. So. Yeah, oh, Google. There you go. Yeah, Google. 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 So, wrong, dude. Wrong there, again. David. There I would. Go. I would write a heavily worded letter to them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was going to ask, are there any other creatures or cryptids that you feel like are a bit more unknown or a bit haven't been explored um, in depth? Like, you know, how Dogman was very, not very well known, um, uh, you know, just 30 years ago. And now it's like a, a big topic in the, in the very forefront or not very, I don't know how to say it. It's like in the mainstream now, I guess is the best well, way it's, to put it's it. It's becoming more mainstream. It's becoming more not mainstream. Not yet. Yeah. So are there any other cryptids? Just in general, in general terms, you mean? Yeah, exactly. So are there yeah. any cryptids that you are that are like that, where you know are a bit more unknown? There, there are, and that's kind of uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this series on the individual states is to to delve into some of the other stories that people 
either aren't familiar with or they only know just the bare you know surface uh, bit of the story uh the a great example is the new book that the next book that's coming out is is on cryptids and legends of indiana and of course there's sasquatch sightings there but there's some other weird things there and we'll we'll talk about that when i come back on but the cover uh, if you've seen it is of uh, a giant turtle and that's the story of the beast of busco uh, oscar as he was dubbed and you know, a lot of people don't really know a whole lot about the story it's, it's kind of it's kind of a, a fascinating human story a story of human nature in a sense uh but i don't want to give too much away yet but you know that's just an example what i'm trying to do with the series uh each one i do of course include a, a good chunk of uh sasquatch uh accounts and and history because that's uh, in virtually every state, you'll find that. But every state also has these incredible legends and stories of other cryptids that in modern times, frankly, get overshadowed by the Bigfoot accounts. Uh, so I like to, to shed some light on those. You know, with Alaska, I, I delved into the Kushtaka, the Thunderbirds, the, the legends of the, the living mammoths and some of these other things. And uh, in each book, I try to do that. No, Nevada, of course, has Tahoe Tessie, uh, you know, this uh, water creature that lives in Lake Tahoe. Uh, it has uh, some other crazy stories, too. Um, you know, it has the, the account of the space clams, which uh, has gotten a lot of attention. It's just one-off encounter, but it's just really weird and intriguing at the same time. Uh, so... Uh, Arizona, you know, I did Arizona and, and I covered the Thunderbirds down there as uh, a famous story of the Tombstone Thunderbird. But there are other accounts, too, of people seeing what appears to be some kind of prehistoric, you know, uh, petrosaur flying in, over the desert sky. So, yeah, I definitely believe that there's there's not one singular one, but there's a lot of them uh, all over that need to be explored and given a little bit more light. And that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I think you're probably doing a good, good job. <laughs> I mean, I, I, unfortunately, David, I will admit, I haven't read any of your books, and uh, I'm looking to read the they, Strange and True were, ones. They weren't 120 words, that's why. Yeah, they went over 120 words, and his millennial brain's like, ah! I read the cover, and I, I read David, and I just immediately fell asleep. He became, like, he oh, became confused and angry, David. That's how millennials are. <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess my final question is, uh, for, or do you have any tips or uh, advice to either new researchers or new authors You know, trying to get into the... Um, business because i asked linda the same thing and, and do you want me to say what she said or do you want to give your answer first read read <laughs> <laughs> there you go linda was like you're really dumb and then she just hung up yeah she yeah. kind of no i mean well she actually gave great advice she said start where you uh, you know start with where you're familiar basically just yeah, start, do what start with what you know yeah, exactly look around you there's all kinds of stuff that's why i do texas that's yeah. why i started out mostly was just doing texas because that's where i'm from and you know so, David, that was great. Uh, that's awesome. I appreciate you coming on the show and giving us your time and talking to us. And, and your books uh, are awesome, folks. Um, cre uh, Monsters from, I was going to say Creatures again. Monsters from the Last Frontier, Alaska. Awesome book. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. He's got a ton of other books. And he is, like I said, he's dropping it like it's hot. And the new one he's coming out with in Indiana. Um Right, and you're going to be writing some other projects. You got some other stuff going on, and and hopefully, uh, I got lots of other stuff coming up. Uh, everybody can check out eerielights.com. That is e e r i e lights.com, and you'll see uh, you can see the the covers of the upcoming books there, articles, uh, information about appearances I make, and lots of other stuff. So check that out if you get a chance. Yeah, and we can try to put that link up when we. Uh, on the show when we do it it'll be on parent on the uh, paranormal roundtable we'll put the link up and and so you guys can check it out <clears throat> eerielights.com david weatherly and i appreciate you coming on a fellow texan and talking about uh the black eyed kids and alaska and uh thanks for your time dave oh, it's been fun hey, it's great talking with you guys you have a good night now yeah you too bye bye, bye, -bye.